Good morning, everybody, and welcome to ECHA's online information session on the restriction, proposed restriction for intentionally added microplastics. The objectives of today's session is to introduce, firstly, the scope of the proposed restriction on the placing on the market of the uh, inten inten intentionally added microplastics, and also go through the public consultation. Uh, the expectations for the public consultation. Uh, we will also be answering uh, questions that uh, are sent in uh, uh, to us uh, on these two issues, on the proposed scope and the objectives of the public consultation. The hope this session will help potential respondents to decide if and what information to be submitted in the public consultation which has already started. Uh, one thing we would just like to, to clarify that we don't want uh, today to be a debate on the merits of the proposal. This is something that will occur during the opinion making on the proposal uh, and uh, based on the comments that are sent in in the public consultation. So the information session is structured as you can see on the slide. Uh, we have a brief introduction from myself uh, and then we go straight into the first session on the scope of the proposed restriction where uh, my colleague Peter will give a summary of the uh, restriction and then we will have a Q&A panel uh, for about uh, 30 minutes on the uh, scope and derogation topics. Then we will have a short break uh, for 10 minutes and then we will have a second session on objectives for the public consultation. Uh, and this, my colleague Evgenia Stoyanova will give a presentation on the technical points, general questions and specific questions uh, related to the public consultation. And then we will have a further Q&A panel uh, to discuss uh, these, uh, these topics. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you need to use the Q&A panel uh, on the WebEx. Uh, and uh, we will, as you can see on the screen in front of you, we will try to answer as many questions as we can today, uh, but if we don't answer your question, then please, please feel free to submit the question uh, through our contact form, and you can see the address on the slide now. Uh, after the session, we will publish a question and answers document covering all the main issues raised, and uh, this will be published on our Hot Topics site uh, on the uh, ECHO website. Uh, all press inquiries, as normal, should go to our press office and the email address is on the uh, screen in front of you. Just to let you know that the recording, uh, this uh, WebEx session will be recorded and uh, published uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and also uh, material for the webinar will be published on our website, uh, both the Q&A and the link to the recording through the uh, Hot Topics page. So briefly, just to introduce uh, the, uh, the subject that we are uh, doing today and uh, reach restrictions, uh, it's important to remember that uh, restrictions can be any condition uh, on a substance uh, or uh, on its own or in a mixture or in an article. And uh, it can be for the manufacture or the import or the use of uh, one of these, uh, of this, the substance. Uh, it, uh, and uh, it's there to address, address a risk that's not adequately controlled and where action is required at a union level. Uh, and it's uh, also a, a, a safety net for other REACH and EU processes. Now the dossier submitter can be a member state or ECHA and there are a few limitations to the scope of a restriction. For example, there's no minimum tonnage and it can apply to uses that aren't covered by other parts of REACH such as medicinal products, polymers, cosmetics. Uh, certain uses are often derogated uh, and can continue after the restriction where uh, it's felt that society overall would not benefit from restricting the use. Uh, you can see in front of you the main timelines for a restriction. Uh, the first uh, stage is obviously the development of the, registration, uh, the restriction dossier. Uh, and this has already been done by ECHA and uh, was uh, submitted uh, in January. Uh, the next stage is the conformity check uh, in uh, both of our scientific committees that deal with risk and socioeconomic issues. And this conformity check has already taken place in the March meetings 
and both committees found that the uh, proposal was in conformity and therefore the public consultation on the proposal could start. And uh, as you see, this is the first step in the next stage of the process, which is the opinion making process. This is where our two scientific committees, uh, composed of independent scientists, uh, evaluate the proposal that's been made. And uh, during this uh, process, uh, which takes between uh, nine and 12 months, depending on which of the committees it is, there will be running uh, a public consultation uh, for six months, which uh, started uh, in, uh, in March, 20th of March. Uh, and uh, here we, uh, is the opportunity for stakeholders to send in information uh, on the, uh, the proposal to support or to, uh, to add to the knowledge base uh, so the uh, uh, rapporteurs uh, and uh, the committees can uh, evaluate the, uh, the proposal. Uh, RAC, will, uh, which is the Risk Assessment Committee, will uh, adopt their uh, opinion uh, in nine months from the date of the public consultation starting and SEAC 12 months. And uh, in between the RAC finishing and uh, SEAC finishing, there is a further public consultation of, 90, of 60 days. And following this, ECHA will send the opinions to the Commission for the decision-making part of the process. But we won't go into that today. So now I'd like to hand over to my colleague Peter for the uh, introduction to the first session uh, on uh, the uh, scope uh, of the proposal. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Mark. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name's Pete Simpson. Um, and I thought what would be useful for the opening session um, of the webinar was to give you um, a brief outline of the scope of the proposed restriction, um, how it's put together, what uses are intended to be covered, um, and as an example, uh, will not. And then hopefully if there are still some, some uncertainties, we can tackle those within the following uh, Q&A session. Um, so I will go through uh, essentially a few elements in the presentation. Um, I'll start with the four elements that comprise the restriction. I'll then go on to talk a little bit about the microplastic definition that we're using to underpin the restriction. Um, I'll talk about the derogations from the scope and how uh, the various derogations and, and why they're there and how they're intended to be interpreted. Uh, a number of the derogations uh, then require either uh, labeling of products or reporting, and then I will go through these as well. Um, I will briefly mention how the restriction is intended to be implemented in such that it's a phased implementation um, with requirements for different sectors coming in uh, after different periods of time after the entry into force. And then very briefly at the end, I'll touch on some analytical considerations. The presentation, I should say, has been informed with, with some discussions that we've had after the, the dossier was initially published. Um, where we, we've taken on board that some elements um, could benefit from some clarification. Okay, so the four elements of the proposed restriction. The first element um, is, is what you could consider to be the ban. It's the prohibition on the placing on the market of microplastics. Um, and this is where the releases to the environment are considered to be inevitable, um, despite the existence of, of, of various risk management measures like, like wastewater treatment works. Um, the second element that, that comprises the restriction are these derogated uses. There are a whole series of derogations um, where the restriction is not intended to apply, where essentially the microplastics are not released to the environment, or for example, a use is already regulated under another piece of, of European legislation. Um, the, other, the third element is this mandatory labelling, and this is, uh, will apply when releases um, that could occur to the environment from the use of microplastic can be avoided or minimised through the uses of uh, through the use of additional instructions for use and then equally and alongside this mostly and there's a requirement for for um, either users of the substances or or this or the people placing those materials on the market to report to ECHA and various elements of those microplastic uses but I'll come to those um, overarching all of this is the microplastic definition and then again these different requirements will will enter into force enter into effect rather for different sectors um, at different time periods um, uh, based on, on socioeconomic considerations, essentially. Okay, so um, when we're talking about the proposed restriction, 
this is listed in paragraph one uh, of the of the restriction in the report that you, you will see hopefully um, and this is that polymers shall from around 2020 this is when we think the restriction could enter into force um, be placed on the market as a substance on its own or in a mixture as a microplastic this is really important in a concentration equal to or greater than about 0.01 percent weight for weight um, and of course there are a number of definitions which then follow from this which we will try and um, clarify um, now um, the first important definition is that of a polymer so of course we mean the reach definition of polymer which is outlined in article 3 5 of reach and then clarified in in the various accompanying guidance to that we're not pre uh, presenting anything different from that within this restriction um, and then we have a definition of a microplastic and what we mean here is a material that consists of solid polymer containing particles to which additives or other substances may have been added alongside the polymer and where um, within this particle size distribution of particles 1% of those particles either have all dimensions between 1 nanometer and 5 millimeters or and this is specific for particles which are considered to be fibers um, a particle size distribution between 3 nanometers and 15 millimeters and then this length to diameter ratio of greater than three which is taken from from world health organization definition of a fiber um, i've just skipped a slide here this is just to elaborate on on what we mean by this particle size distribution um, uh, concept which underpins the microplastic definition um, this is taken directly from the eu nanomaterials definition which which uh, acknowledges that these materials exist as a particle size distribution what we're saying here is that to be considered as a microplastic, 1% of the particles on a weight basis need to fall within a certain size distribution within a distribution of particles. And what you can see from this graph on the right hand side here is that there are particles which fall within the microplastic range, which is shown within the purple vertical bars. And then there are particles within that material which wouldn't meet the, the, the size range because they're, they're either too big or they're too small but essentially what we're saying is that because one percent of those particles on a weight basis would fall within that range the whole material is considered a microplastic okay moving on to some further definitions um, the particle again this is taken from the EU nanomaterials definition we consider a particle as a minute piece of matter with a defined physical boundary and this defined physical boundary is an interface um, the, the first new concept perhaps um, within our definition here is this polymer containing particle concept uh, this means either um, a particle of any composition that has a continuous polymer surface coating of any thickness and then just to elaborate here on the on the left hand side at the bottom you can see various um, non-polymer particles with a polymer coating of various thicknesses so various different morphologies here all we're talking about here is a, is, a, is a polymer coating of some kind around that particle. Um, the other way that you can be considered to be a polymer containing particle is, um, just waiting for this slide to load, here we go, is, is a particle of any composition with a polymer content of greater than 1%. So again, on the right hand side at the bottom, you can see some examples of this. So the, the one version of this is, of course, is, a, is a, a, polymer, uh, a particle which is completely composed of polymer. That would be a polymer containing particle. But also if there's a mixture of polymers and other substances within a particle, which isn't a coating on the outside, what we're suggesting here is that that particle would need to be comprised of greater than 1% on a weight basis of that polymer to be a polymer containing particle again any morphology is relevant and essentially what we're trying to recognize here is that we know that um, polymers are used frequently for this encapsulation sort of use and these would be covered by point one of our polymer containing particle definition um, we've had a number of uh, questions along the way as we've been developing this process in terms of um, what a solid is what we've decided to to use at the end is the is the CLP regulation definitions of, of state and essentially the way that this is put together is, is if a material is, is, is not a gas and it's not a liquid 
then it's considered to be a solid. And this is the basis for our discussions here. Just briefly on this concept of microbeads versus microplastics. Um, we, we understand that sometimes this, this terminology is used interchangeably. We use microbead in a very specific sense within our restriction, and this is um, a microplastic used for a specific function, and is that the function is as an abrasive. So this is to exfoliate in a cosmetic product sense, polish or, or clean if it's used, for example, in a, in a detergent or a maintenance product. Um, and the reason that we do this is because we distinguish between microbeads and other microplastics in terms of this phased implementation. Um, if a microplastic has another function beyond this exfoliating or, or abrasive function, so for example, if it's a pacifying or encapsulating, for example, then it's not a microbead. Um, people may call it a microbead, but for our purposes, it's, it's not a microbead. Okay, now moving on to the derogations from, from the scope. I'll go through these uh, line by line, but relatively quickly, so we have enough time for the questions. Um, the first derogation that is important is, is 3A, and this is polymers that occur in nature that have not been chemically modified other than by hydrolysis. This is to recognise that it, it, uh, implicitly these materials have existed in nature um, through evolutionary time and, and uh, can be considered to be inherently biodegradable. Point 3B builds on, 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 on 3A, but it's to, uh, to derogate polymers that can be um, perhaps modified or synthetic polymers that can be demonstrated to be biodegradable. And I'll elaborate on that in a moment. What's important to recognise that under the for the purposes of this restriction, any of these materials derogated are not considered to be microplastics and therefore wouldn't be subject to any restriction or any of the associated labelling or reporting requirements. They are outside of the scope of the restriction. Um, just building on these biodegradability criteria, these are presented in detail in section 2.1.6 of the Annex 15 report in table 21. You sometimes he hear us referring to Appendix X when we're talking about those criteria. What we've presented here is a tiered approach with a variety of methods associated with clear pass or fail criteria so they can be readily interpreted by, by people that will be affected so whether or no if, if they're passing or failing uh, a test. Um, it's made up at early tiers of screening tests. These are the relatively well-known tests. And of course, if you pass these tests, then you, you can prove that your material is biodegradable and then you would, you would um, benefit from that derogation 3B. Um, if, for example, an early tier, um, you're perhaps failing the pass-fail criteria. And again, just waiting for my slide to load. Um, then it's possible that you will um, move on to the subsequent test, which should appear in a moment. And essentially it would be um, an inherent biodegradability test. Here they come now. And again, it's the same principle. So if you pass that test with the criteria, pass-fail criteria proposed in the annex, then you're subject to the derogation. And if you fail, you can move on to increasingly more and more sophisticated tests if necessary, um, culminating in what we call higher tier assessment, where essentially you compare um, in a simulation type study um, the half-life of a material to the, to the relevant Annex 13 uh, cr criteria for a very persistent substance. Uh, running alongside all of this is this requirement for the test to be conducted by a laboratory that's certified uh, under this ISO 17025 standard. Essentially, this recognises that um, uh, um, people that would want to benefit from this derogation don't apply to ECHA, for example. It would essentially become an enforcement issue. So in order that this can be enforceable, it needed to be clear with the clear pass-fail criteria and also um, to have clear, reliable, robust, quality-assured data available, which is why these requirement for the quality standard is there. OK, further derogations um, from paragraph one are uses at industrial sites. And um, we're referring uh, stakeholders back to the ECHA R12 guidance, really, for interpretation of what an industrial site is. Um, and then for, for um, uses of medicinal products for human and veterinary use that are already regulated in the EU, they're derogated. However, they are subject to these labelling and re reporting requirements. Uh, also derogated are substances or mixtures 
which are already regulated under the revised um, EU regulation on fertilising products. And the reason that these are derogated is that this regulation already contains provisions uh, for the use of biodegra biodegradable polymers uh, within these fertilising products. So there's essentially there's no need for us to, to impose additional criteria onto this. Um, and as such, there's no labelling and reporting required for that. Um, now, alongside those derogations, there are a further set of derogations that can perhaps be considered uh, consumer professional use type derogations. So these derogations aren't intended for uses that are occurring on industrial sites, for example. Um, the first is uses of microplastics that are contained by technical means throughout their life cycle and where any microplastic con uh, containing wastes are, are disposed of as though they're hazardous waste. And this is in, essentially intended for, for uses uh, of microplastics that we know are occurring in, in in vitro diagnostic medical devices or other similar sort of laboratory scale um, uses for, for purification of, of water, for example, or um, other such iron exchange type processes which are happening in a, in a professional context rather than an industrial one. Uh, Labelling is required for, for this, but not reporting. Uh, derogation 5B is for microplastics um, that are permanently modified when they're used such that they're no longer microplastics. So there wouldn't be a release of, of, of microplastics necessarily um, from this use because they're essentially losing their particulate form at the point of use. And this, this is a, again at the professional use stage, not at industrial sites. So what we're thinking of here is, is film forming uh, in paints, and coatings and in cosmetics, for example, so microplastics don't exist after that film is formed. Soluble polymers would also um, fall within this type of derogation because those particles would no longer exist. Uh, and the third type of uh, derogation here is where the microplastics are considered to be permanently incorporated within a solid matrix when they're, when they're used. Um, and this is intended for building and construction type applications where where the microplastics would end up embedded within another material and wouldn't be able to be released. Um, running alongside both of these two are the labelling and reporting requirements. I have an example here of, of the paints and coatings just to try and elaborate a little bit on our thinking. Uh, at the top half of the diagram here you can see a film forming where the particles are, are essentially organising themselves during a film and they're deforming and then coalescing during this, the drying of the film. At this point they're no longer microplastics. And we would say um, that they're derogated under 5B. Now, we know that other particles, other microplastics are used within paints, for example, and they wouldn't form a film, but they would be embedded in a film um, alongside uh, during the film forming process. And there's some examples here. Um, so we would suggest that they would also be derogated from the restriction on the basis of, of the paragra of paragraph 5C because they would be permanently in included within this film. OK, so we've seen that some of the derogations will attract this labelling requirement. Um, essentially, what we're saying here, and the, there's various um, sorts of labelling where we would see uh, this requirement be relevant to, and essentially what we're proposing here is, is additional instructions of use that should avoid or minimise the releases of microplastics that could be occurring during that use. So, for example, with this film forming type of application, we're proposing to, to improve the information available for professionals and consumers so that they would minimise the amount of microplastics that are being released into the environment from that use. So, for example, the instruction could be something like uh, to remove excess paint before washing the brushes and rollers within the sink. We're not proposing this, this actual text. We think that stakeholders are best placed to, to provide the most uh, useful and, and uh, an effective instructions here, but this is the sort of thing that we have in mind so that you're clear what we're talking about. And for the medicinal uses, for example, and, and, and I think in, in many member states these instructions are already there, but it would be not to dispose of these medicines down the drain, for example, where, where eventually the microplastics could exist in the, in the environment if released. Uh, the reporting, again, w w accompanies the, the labelling. This is essentially to get greater understanding of, of the potential releases to the environment from these derogated uses over time in case there's ever uh, a rationale for additional uh, risk management. Um, we've clarified in the, in the version of the documents that we've published for the public consultation um, what we mean here. Uh, essentially, we, we want the users of the substance at industrial sites to do the reporting. Uh, 
And then for any of the uh, downstream users or importers placing uh, microplastics on the environment that would be derogated under um, 4B, for example, or these 5B or 5C derogations, then they would um, do the reporting uh, as they place on the market, not the downstream consumers or professionals. So there's a difference there in terms of who would who would be doing the reporting. Um, we envisage uh, an online system that's very similar to the existing system under the authorizations regime, where downstream users that are using a substance on the basis of an authorization would report their use back to ECHA. Um, it's a web form and it allows confidential information, for example, to be uh, claimed as confidential within that reporting so that it's not further disseminated um, when those reports are made public. Um, I said I'd mention about the phased implementation. This is, you can see, a timeline here. I think it would just draw your attention to the fact that microbeads um, appear on the furthest left. So there's no uh, implementation period envisaged for microbeads. Uh, it's considered that these exfoliating and, and, and abrasive uses are already alternatives available in the market, so there's no need for an additional time for the supply chain to react. Whereas other uses, it's considered uh, and acknowledged that there would be good justification for this restriction to come in over a period of time to allow um, society as a whole to adapt. And, and different sectors have different lengths of um, implementation period proposed. Um, I have one final slide, which I hope will appear any minute now. Here we go. And this is essentially just on these analytical considerations. Uh, we understand that this is this is, is an element of, of uh, the proposal that our stakeholders are very interested in. I draw, draw your attention to the tiered approach that's outlined in the report about how analytical considerations could be approached. Um, and then what we consider here is that there are three elements that piece uh, that could be um, explored in this tiered approach. The first of all, you would you would look at a product and, and understand whether or not it contained polymers. And this could perhaps be readily available from, from information from suppliers or, or perhaps even from the labelling, if, if labelling is well developed for, for certain types of products. Um, it, looking at the next tier, we would uh, want to, it would be interesting to know whether or not the product contains particles within this relevant particle size distribution. And of course, if this isn't known from, from information from suppliers, for example, then I think we're, we are, we're confident that rather standard sieving methods would be in general applicable to determine um, the presence of particles in the particle size distribution. But we do acknowledge particularly for, for very small uh, particles, other methods like dynamic light scattering or even some of the methods that have been developed for nanomaterials might actually be relevant to look at the particle size distribution. Uh, and then finally, if, if you have a, a mixture that you know has polymers in, and it has particles in, then you might want to know what the uh, content of the polymer is within the particle. And then there's various other combinations of analytical methods that may be relevant here. We won't go into detail now, but um, they're, they're certainly outlined within the report. And, and please have a look at those before you uh, consider whether or not to, to ask some questions in the public consultation. OK, Mark, that's what I had to say on that. And we can move on, I think, to the Q&A panel. Thanks, Peter. Yes, we have uh, half an hour now to have a uh, Q&A session on this first uh, topic on the, the scope of the uh, um, proposed restriction. Um, I'm joined in addition to Pete by two further colleagues, uh, Perti Ilo and Anu Kapanen. Uh, and uh, we will uh, go through the questions that have been sent in. Uh, as I said, if we do not uh, manage to get to your question, then uh, you can send it in through the uh, through our normal channels, uh, or uh, in any case, we will try to deal as with as many as questions as possible in our future Q, uh, question and answers. So let's go to the first question now on uh, synthetic polymers in solution, uh, and this is uh, is, Ek, is it Ecker's intention that a polymer in solution will not have interfaces and therefore is not classed as a as a microplastic. Uh, I think uh, maybe Perti or Pete, you could take this one. Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, if the if the polymer is in solution so that it's not uh, in in a solid state, uh, then it would not fall within the in the uh, scope of the restriction. Uh, 
if the synthetic polymer in solution is, is in, in a form of a particle, then it, it, it would fall fall in, in, in with the definition. So the question is really about the, uh, about the presence of, of solid particles. If it's not solid, then it's not within the definition. Okay, thank you, Petty. Uh, okay, then uh, let's go on to the, the second question. This is uh, a question we have received uh, outside of the, uh, the webinar as, as well about that the, uh, it's been noticed that the proposed restriction and other parts of the dossier have been reworded since uh, the um, dossier was published uh, in, uh, in uh, January uh, and um, could ECHA inform stakeholders uh, when updates have been made uh, and um, also uh, indicate which parts have been changed. Uh, and I think I will, I will take this one. Uh, I think it's first important to say that we publish, ECHA publishes the restriction dossiers uh, before um, the, uh, the process formally starts, uh, when dossiers have been submitted for transparency reasons. Uh, we understand that stakeholders want to see the proposal as quickly as possible, but this isn't a, a legal requirement uh, and uh, we do it because we want to be as, as open and transparent as possible. The version which is um, going to be subject to the public consultation is the one that is published uh, at the uh, time when we open the public consultation. And in this case, yes, there were some changes made uh, since the uh, version that was uh, originally uploaded onto the, uh, the web uh, on in, in January. Uh, we have been thinking a little about what we can do and we will try to make it clearer uh, that uh, there has been a change to the, uh, the uh, version that was uh, originally uh, published on the website and we're considering how to best indicate where the major changes were, were made. Uh, and um, then we will we will put this on to the uh, uh, into the dossier uh, at the same time as we publish the uh, the Q and A that we will uh, we will be doing in the next uh, uh, week or so. But I think it's worth stressing that the version which uh, we are uh, which has been um, uh, subject to the public consultation is the version which is published uh, on the twentieth uh, uh, of March. Yeah, maybe just to add, Mark, yep. just on those changes, um, they are purely of of the nature of clarification types of, of, of edits. So, I mean, we recognise it's a long document and perhaps you've been through it once and you're thinking, oh, no, we have to go through it again. We haven't hidden anything in any of those changes and um, they're just there to try and clarify um, what the original intent of, of the document that was published in, in January was. So, and, and hopefully it's clearer now than it was. But there's nothing hidden in there that perhaps... Uh, if you miss, w would be subsequently in important. Okay, thank you for that, Pete. Uh, then we have uh, a question. Next question is on solubility. So how does solubility fit with particle and microplastic definition and biodegradation? Are soluble polymers exempted from the restriction? Maybe I start with Perty, and then uh, maybe if other colleagues, if they have something to add, can, uh, can do so. So uh, this question is, is, of course, uh, linked to the previous one. Uh, and, and, and the question of, of the solubility. Uh, I would like to stress that the uh, importance is the presence of these solid particles. So uh, if, if, if you have a soluble polymers, uh, which are not in the form of particle, these do not uh, fulfill the definition of a microplastic, as, as we have proposed it in the, in the restriction proposal. However, uh, we should bear in mind that in, we have cases, for example, the ones with uh, peat showed uh, in the presentation where polymers can be binded into a secondary particles and, and uh, even soluble pol polymers can uh, can react with uh, support material and, and therefore be binded permanently to a particle. These particles may, may be within the, in the scope of the restriction depending on the amount of the polymer. Any further? Well I think I think it's just to emphasize mm -hmm. that the we, we recognise this issue of solubility, but we also recognise that actually definitively measuring solubility for polymers is, is rather complicated. Yes. And then we felt that if we just avoided this concept of solubility within the actual 
uh, legal legal text proposal and instead substituted it for this issue of particle, which is perfect, in, probably easier to understand. It would it would address some of these uncertainties about measuring solubility of polymers, for example. But we we recognise this sort of this concept of solubility, but we just don't express it using the word solubility within the proposal. Mm. And we outline this within more, it's more within the annexes if people mm. want to get into that. Any further? Uh, yes, thank you. And, and in case the, the particle remains uh, in a solution, then you need to assess the, the biodegradability against the criteria set in the proposal. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is about one of the, uh, the derogations, 5B, which is uh, about uh, substance or mixtures containing microplastics where the physical properties of the microplastic are permanently modified when the substance or mixture is used. And the question is that uh, does this derogation apply to microplastics that are solubilised during the use? Pete, is yeah, exactly. Can we take? can answer this one very quickly. This derogation is is designed to address exactly that, that <coughs> change in, in states where the particles no longer exist uh, at the point of use because they are going through this sort of dissolution process. Any further? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next um, question is on the uh, industrial sites and referring to the guidance R12. And the question is, the guidance R12 doesn't fully clarify what is and what or what is not an industrial site, in particular uh, for uh, big industries with many, maybe many facilities uh, on one uh, site, uh, each with a with a small footprint. Uh, I think I will I can answer that in saying that, of course, the guidance R12 does not just cover uh, the issues for microplastics. This is a guidance which covers. Um, elements of reach much more widely in, in terms of the uh, guidance on industrial sites. And uh, so in that case, I, I think we would uh, need to um, also uh, consult some colleagues on this, this question and come back in the, in the public consultation. But just to say it's our, our understanding when we drafted this that um, such sites as uh, offshore facilities would be caught by this industrial uh, site definition. I don't know, Pete, is there anything more you would like to add? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, uh, and this particular question, we've also taken up bilaterally with the with the affected sector as well. So we're aware of it. And I think, you know, just make us uh, aware and also the rapporteurs uh, who will be responsible for drafting these opinions um, are aware of this particular issue. So please raise it within the public consultation. OK, the uh, next question is on uh, particle size distribution, I think, about larger particles uh, for example, uh, 20 millimetres is mentioned uh, with a small amount of uh, abraded dust in, in a very small uh, uh, range of, of, of size. Uh, this is difficult to measure to determine number size averages. And do we have any kind of advice on, on, on how that might be done? Perti, please. Yeah, uh, this is actually a, a great question. Uh, and this is something that we, we thought about quite carefully when, uh, when making a, a proposal. Uh, we understand that there might be an issue in uh, determining the number size averages and this is why in the uh, restriction proposal we are uh, suggesting to use a uh, weight by weight averages instead and uh, in if you apply weight by weight uh, then you can use uh, your standard saving methods to uh, to determine the, uh, the di uh, size distribution uh, in a more more uh, straightforward way so uh, so the restriction proposal uh, refers to weight, uh, weight average, uh, and, and uh, not to uh, number size average distribution. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, next question, I think we'll be coming back to you again, Perti, on uh, polyerms. Uh, are polyerms Almost. obtained from polylactic acid considered mm -hmm. as microplastics? Uh, yes, so uh, in, in the restri restri rest, uh, restriction proposal, we have not uh, uh, outlined or separated any distinction between polymer types. Uh, if polylactic acid is, is a synthetically uh, produced polymer, and, and if it's in, in, a, in a solid uh, particle form, then it would fall within the definition of, of, of the 
of the restriction proposal, then the question comes whether there is some uh, derogations to be utilized due to the use or, or some other reason. Okay, any other? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question is on the uh, microplastic definition, and is it harmonized across all the EU? Maybe Pete, you can, you can take that one. Uh, yes, I mean, when we were developing the, the dossier, we, we looked at all of the various uh, different types of definitions of microplastics that had been proposed both um, within the EU but also in, uh, internationally as well. Uh, and then we, we quickly came to the conclusion that there wasn't a harmonised definition of a microplastic across the EU that we could readily pick up. Um, but essentially the, the definition of a microplastic that we are proposing here uh, would become a harmonised uh, definition wherever, the, wherever reach applies, so within the EU. EEA and the, and the EU. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next um, question, in fact the next two questions I think are, are on the same issue about uh, uh, master batches and uh, pre-production pellets. Uh, so the first question is about uh, no um, impact assessment has been made for master batch uses. Can ECHA clarify that master batches are out of scope of this proposal? I think I'll start and then maybe mm -hmm. pass on. I think it's important to understand that during the uh, dossier preparation process, we made it quite uh, clear that, uh, um, that uh, the definition of microplastics would be quite broad, and we encouraged all stakeholders to send in information on their the uses where the, um, the, uh, the type of product they use could fall within this, this definition, and then we would be able to assess uh, the uh, the risk and the impact from uh, from these uses, where we didn't receive information on uh, uh, uses, uh, we have not taken these uh, into account, and we have assumed that actually the impact will be quite uh, quite low because otherwise uh, industry would have sent us in uh, information. So if uh, products don't uh, fall within one of the uh, the derogations, and, and I think Pete can, can talk mm -hmm. a little bit about this for these particular products, uh, and uh, they're not uh, part of the phased input of the, uh, the restriction, then they are restricted from the uh, beginning of the entry into force. But Pete, maybe you want to, to add something? Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, I think that's an important point to recognise again for the public consultation as well. So if, you're, if your use isn't uh, specifically identified, and, it, and it's not clear that it's derogated, then of course please provide information in the public consultation. Um, but for this one, I think we can clarify that master batches will be used on industrial sites, so they would be out, outside of the scope of this restriction on placing on the market, but they would be within the scope of the restriction in terms of the labelling and reporting requirements. Um, you could also think about this um, in terms of when those master batches are used, then they would, they would if they're an article is being made from those master batches, pellets being extruded, for example, into another uh, source of material, then of course they would lose their particle form at that point as well, so that, so they wouldn't be a result in releases of microplastics. So they're sort of half in scope and half out of scope. So the, it's, the, it's the industrial uses where the reporting and labelling will need to, to be done. Okay, thanks. I think actually the uh, third question, the next question as well, is also on this same issue <coughs> on uh, polymer pellets. Uh, polymer pellets are microplastics by definition uh, and um, derogation 4A is only valid for mixtures containing microplastics, not for microplastics themselves. Therefore, no placing on, therefore it will be restricted from being placed on the market. I think, Pete, you've already uh, answered this in terms of these. We think these issues will be uh, mainly uh, done on industrial sites. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but if, if, the, um, if that's not the case and the uh, derogation you do not think is, is appropriate, then uh, of course it's up to you then to, um, to send uh, uh, information in, in, the, in the public consultation and we'll cover this uh, in the uh, second, se second session. But just to say that the emphasis, the uh, uh, responsibility is now on stakeholders to provide uh, appropriate risk and socio-economic information to justify any further uh, derogations or any other measures for uh, uses which have not been uh, specifically covered. This one as well I can elaborate Eight, yes. on um, is that uh, this derogation was, was one that was slightly reworded. So 4A now talks about substances and mixtures used at industrial sites. But I think that just the point that I would make is that 
a microplastic um, because those pellets would contain polymers and other substances, for example, would quite readily be considered to be mixtures rather than substances themselves. So those pellets, I think, w would always have been outside of, yeah. of scope okay. um, on the basis. So, so not an issue from our side, but okay. what we think. But thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, so the next question is on uh, paints. Would the derogation for paints also be applicable to the use of paints by consumers? Sorry, Pete, maybe this one Yeah, is absolutely. Again. That's the, the derogation exactly for placing on the market for consumer professional use is, is foreseen by this derogation. Um, but it would be the, uh, the people that were placing that paint on the market would be responsible for these labelling and reporting requirements. Thanks. And then uh, again on the film forming uh, artist paints, I, they, I assume they also are subject to the, the derogation that you have already talked yeah, about. Yeah, if they contain microplastics, then yes. Okay, thank you for that. And, and uh, thank you very much for all the, the questions that are coming in. They're, they're extremely interesting and relevant. And, and uh, we have uh, uh, another uh, 12 minutes to, uh, to continue with uh, questions on this issue. So the next question is on uh, um, uh, supply chains. So company A ships microplastic particles to company B within the EU. Then an article is produced by company B uh, where the microplastic particles are consumed uh, in accordance with uh, uh, the uh, derogation we have previously talked about, 5B. Mm -hmm. So um, are there any obligations remaining on, on company A or company B? Company A, the the uh, uh, the importer, I assume, or the in, intra EU mm -hmm. shipper, and then company B, the the, the, the user. Yeah. Um, well, I think it, it, we would need a bit more information about where these uses yeah. were is actually happening uh, to give to give a more precise answer in terms of, of what we'd intended. But I think these would both be uses at industrial sites, so they would rather be covered under five B. They would be covered under four A. So therefore, it would be the the people using these materials that would have the reporting and the and the labelling obligations, and we have to think about that the, the reason for that labelling reporting, well, the labelling rather is to to improve the knowledge available to the users of these materials in industrial settings to avoid potential releases of those materials to the to the environment. Okay, the next question is on uh, research and development and low volumes, uh, whether there are going to be exemptions uh, for microplastics similar to, uh, I assume this is this is registration or downstream user requirements in, in REACH. Uh, just to say, as I think Pete covered in his, uh, in his presentation, there are no uh, tonnage limits to the, uh, to the restriction uh, and uh, this is not intended uh, for the, um, uh, from the, uh, the restriction as it stands at the moment. Uh, but uh, there are uh, general um, exemptions for research and development within uh, the restrictions um, um, title of REACH. Uh, and I don't know, Peter, if there's anything... That was what I was going to okay. just highlight, okay. that I think by default R&D is outside yes. of the scope of restrictions, yes. so this is why it's not specifically identified yes. within our... But population. I think it's important to, uh, to look quite closely at the definition of uh, um, scientific research and development uh, to, to make sure that uh, uh, the use... Uh, that uh, the, this uh, questioner is putting uh, their, uh, their um, microplastics to are covered, and if not, then please uh, in include information on the use in the public consultation. Mm. I think derogation 5A, where this, where this, um, this typical <coughs> containment and wastes arising disposed of as hazardous waste, is intended to, to if it's not R&D, it would cover these professional sort of laboratory type um, settings yes. where the microplastics okay. can be readily controlled. Um, the next questions on food contact materials. Are food contact materials included within the proposed restriction? Sorry Pete, again is this one <laughs> no, you, no, can, um, no, you can answer? Um, food contact materials, I think if they're regulated under the food contacts legislation, I, don't, I think we would try and avoid double regulation, but if, if um, we know that food additives for example, certain food additives would be captured by by the restriction here. I think um, if there are specific applications that you would like to make us aware of that we haven't analysed, and you can see this from the from the documentation, then this would be important to tell us in the public consultation. Thank you. I mean, uh, also the uh, food content materials might be already exempted by the size uh, criteria, for mm, example, mm. and the particle criteria in the uh, 
in the definition. And uh, uh, but if we have missed the specific mm -hmm. use of microplastics uh, in food uh, or food contact materials, then then please uh, include information on this. And we are uh, just to to reassure you, we are discussing with EFSA as well, the uh, mm -hmm. our sister agency, the European Food Safety Agency, uh, on this issue as well to make sure that. Uh, we, uh, we get information from, from them uh, and hopefully also in the public consultation. I mean, just to say, certainly any films which are used for food packaging are, are outside of the scope of what we're proposing yes. here. Uh, next question is on uh, um, natural fibres. So, Piety, I think this is one for you. Uh, are uh, natural cellulose fibres, polyethylene glycols and polyamines considered to be microplastics? So uh, for, for this, we go back uh, to the definition. Uh, so the question is that whether, whether the polymers cited here are uh, naturally occurring polymers or not. Uh, if they are not naturally occurring polymers or if they're modified naturally occurring polymers. And if they are within uh, as a solid particles, then they would be within the scope. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to say only based on the polymer name, uh, whether they are uh, considered to be microplastics or not. Uh, for example, in the Examples given here, polyethylene glycols are known to be uh, completely soluble polymers in a water solution which do not form, uh, form particles in themselves. Uh, however, for example, some poluamines may be in a form of a solid, some are in a form of a liquid. So just based on the polymer name, uh, it's, it's not possible to give a complete answer, answer for this. Okay, thank you. Um, then the next question is on the hierarchy of applying the criteria of the definition. I mean, I think this might involve all, mm. <coughs> all three uh, panelists. Maybe um, uh, either Peter or Perti can start, and then maybe Anu could also give uh, some thoughts on the uh, uh, criteria in terms of biodegradation as well. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I don't know which of the... Maybe we can make a start. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, in, in uh, principle, there is no hierarchy of, of uh, all the criteria in, in the definition. Uh, the defini uh, definition is built so that all the criteria should be met in order to, that the uh, substance could be considered as a microplastics uh, under this proposal. So, uh, what I mean by this is that uh, uh, it, it needs to be in a form of a particle and the particle needs to be within the uh, certain uh, dimensions and this particle needs to con uh, contain the, the polymer as, as outlined. If any of these are not met, then, uh, then it would not be uh, con considered as a, as a microplastic. So uh, there is no, no inherent hierarchy in the definition. Maybe Pete, you want to? Well, maybe only to say that if, if you have a microplastic um, that fulfills all of these elements, then yes. you might want to see whether or not it would be biodegradable. Yes, and then that's, that's the next. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So if we think this, all these possibilities to demonstrate that the uh, microplastic is uh, biodegradable in the environment, so there's no hierarchy in which of those methods would be uh, better to apply. It totally depends on, on the type of the microplastics and, and, and uh, the kind of the form and the size and how, how it behaves in the environment. So both, uh, both screening tests for biodegradability and, and higher tier tests are as valid as if these criteria that are described here are met. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then we have a, a question on uh, particles and fibers. Uh, so um, the definition of particles and fibres are different, especially for the length. The fibres definition is foreseen for airborne fibres, which is probably not the scope of this restriction. Uh, therefore, fibres should only be less than 5 millimetres. I mean, maybe, Perti, you can at least give a, an explanation why we had these different uh, dimension uh, criteria for, yeah. for these two. So uh, the criteria that we outlined, it, uh, it, it was uh, developed... Uh, Based, uh, based on the call for uh, evidence in, in which we had a, a wider uh, criteria for the, for the dimension. And uh, the purpose of, of this was really to, to capture uh, specifically the fibers, uh, which we, which based on the information that we had, uh, we saw that there is a specific issues that should be addressed. 
uh, and and uh, no, knowing this, uh, we had uh, uh, we opted out for having two different uh, definitions, uh, knowing that uh, majority of the of the products based on market would not be in a fiber form, and we just considered that this distinction would be meaningful and more uh, more easy to implement and to and, and to understand. Uh, but it really stems from the uh, from the hazard perspective that was outlined. Okay, thank you for that. I think we have time for probably just one more question before the, the break. So um, we have a question here on uh, uh, polymer particles acting as absorbent gels uh, and uh, the change size during the, the use and they do not have clearly defined boundaries. Uh, is this uh, something which is within the, uh, the scope of the uh, restriction? Maybe Pete, you can take this or? Uh, well, yes. So, Bertie per per can sort of elaborate. I think. I think it comes back to this particle basis as well. So, if a, if the material is no longer existing as a particle, then it would fall side, uh, outside of the scope um, of the restriction. Um, I think what's interesting is perhaps this reversibility. So, you might end up if if a if an absorbent polymer, for example, has absorbed water, then it wouldn't exist as a particle. But then, if it dried out again, it would perhaps exist as a particle. I think the information that we had during the development of the dossier was that if this drying out would happen, then uh, then perhaps these particles would be larger than five millimeters, which is which is why we, um, uh, we didn't think there was a particularly significant issue with this sort of drying out and um, and, and rewetting. But of course, if if people want to make us aware of something within the public consultation, then then please please let us please do so. Okay, um, I think that's uh, as much as we have uh, time for for this, uh, for this first session. Uh, so I'd just like to thank uh, Peter, Perti and, and Anu for, uh, for their input. And uh, um, just to remind you that if your question was not answered related to this uh, issue of scope or, or definitions, that uh, you can either resubmit it through the information uh, points uh, for ECHA as, as a normal inquiry, or we will attempt to cover as many of these issues as possible during the, the questions and answers that we will, we will publish as, as soon as we can. So thank you very much for all the questions, very interesting questions that were sent in. I think they were very valuable to uh, uh, help uh, explain further the, uh, the scope of the uh, proposal. And uh, now we have a uh, short break. Uh, while we change the uh, composition of the uh, the panel and we prepare for the uh, the second session, so thank you very much uh, for your patience, and we'll be back uh, in about ten minutes. Uh, we're now going to uh, start the second part of the uh, the session uh, with uh, a presentation from my colleague Evgenia on participating in the public consultation. Please, Evgenia. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, in this uh, presentation, I will cover the objectives of the public consultation, but spend uh, the, pr the majority of the time dedicated to this presentation on specific information needs for this uh, restriction proposal. And I will conclude uh, in a couple of minutes with uh, some other general questions that are asked for all restriction proposals. Um, the aspects, the technical aspects of how to submit a restriction proposal um, will be included in the webinar which will be posted on our website after uh, this this meeting so what are the um, so the the legislation specifically mandates uh, when and for how long the public consultation should be run it also specifies the type of questions or the type of information that uh, um, the committees can be looking for. Uh, as you can see, the first uh, bullet here covers pretty much everything that is submitted with uh, by the dossier submitter. Um, and the second uh, bullet specifically uh, mentions the need for information which can contribute to the development of an assessment of the advantages and disadvantages of the proposed restriction. Um, the objectives of the public consultation include to gather relevant information for the ECHA two com com committees on risk assessment and socioeconomic analysis to help them evaluate the proposed restriction and conclude on whether it is the most appropriate risk management measure. 
Another objective is to engage uh, the stakeholders and the general public in the evaluation of the restriction proposal and also to ensure transparency. This is because all answers, all comments submitted during the public consultation are published on a monthly basis and they are answered by the dossier submitter and the committees. They mention how the comments are addressed in their opinions. As it is with uh, even uh, everyday conversations, um, our <laughs> arguments that are well reasoned usually have um, uh, are usually are more impactful, and uh, it's the same situation also in the public consultation. Uh, it is uh, very difficult to address a, a, a general comment that agrees or disagrees with uh, the proposed restriction. It will be useful for the committees if uh, you specify uh, why you agree or disagree with what elements of the proposal and provide supporting information. This is particularly important for any uh, uh, procedure under reach as uh, there is a, this reverse burden of proof on industry to demonstrate safe use of the substance. All comments are accepted. Uh, they are accepted only uh, by the web form and within uh, the deadline which is September the 20th, 2019. Several comments can be submitted during this period. And in fact, this is encouraged because uh, comments on specific topics are needed at key points of the opinion development. As, as part of the <laughs> information um, note, we have published the schedule of the committee work uh, for both RAC and SAC. And you can see their schedule of how uh, they address different topics throughout the nine-month uh, evaluation of the dossier. This schedule is necessary as the conclusions from one topic feed into uh, the next topic. And uh, they're difficult to, um, to, the sequence is difficult to change. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this plan ensures that uh, the opinions is, are produced on time and um, uh, quite in inefficiently. Therefore, if you have any comments on hazards or costs, you're rec it is recommended that you submit them um, by the first deadline, which is May 20th. If you have information on exposure and risk um, or benefits of the restriction by uh, about October, August the 20th. Um, for each restriction dossier, um, for the start, for the public consultation, specific questions are developed. It is not possible to have an exhaustive list of questions. Therefore, they're uh, targeted at um, areas where there is uh, a greater uncertainty and where the new information can change the conclusions of the analysis. These uh, specific questions are usually developed in collaboration of uh, the rapporteurs, representatives of the two committees, um, the commission, and uh, representatives of the dossier submitter. Uh, for this uh, dossier, six questions are uh, specific questions are prepared, and I will take you with, through uh, each one of them and specifically what we re what uh, is requested by the committees. Um, as was discussed uh, in the first uh, part of, the, of this uh, webinar, uh, polymers that are biodegradable are not microplastics. And uh, a tiered approach is uh, proposed to establish biodegradability criteria. This is in Appendix X uh, or Table 21 in the restriction report. Uh, this is a very important element of uh, the restriction proposal and during the dossier development, the dossier submitter consulted with uh, an expert group on uh, PBT substances and the comments from that group were incorporated in the um, uh, version of the biodegradability de criteria that is published in the report. At this stage, a uh, broader consultation is, need is, uh, is, is, is proposed on these criteria and uh, the information that would be very useful is, are they clear, practical? Have you had any experience with, with these criteria or elements of them? And uh, are there alternative test methods or pass-fail criteria that, uh, that could be considered? Uh, 
uh, your comments will be taken into account by the committees in the uh, in, in their uh, opinions and uh, could lead to changing uh, these criteria. The second question is on granules um, uh, or granular infill infill material. That those are uh, these granules that uh, are um, uh, from end of life uh, tires or other or, uh, other synthetic elastomeric material. Uh, no information was submitted during the call for evidence of, of these uh, materials, but. Uh, Recently, another proposal on these granules was uh, was submitted to ECHA by a member state. Uh, it and uh, based on the information in, on that dossier, the dossier submitter has concluded that these uh, materials fall within the scope of the restriction and would, uh, as it stands, it would they would be restricted from the start um, or from the date of, of entry of uh, the proposed restriction. Uh, this question aims to gather information on the pros and cons of this um, uh, of this uh, uh, res of restricting this use, and uh, here in the question we have listed uh, useful information uh, to that to 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 help the committees conclude. Uh, that's information on uses, releases, um, as but uh, also um, any technical me means to prevent or minimize uh, releases from, from, from these uses as well as their costs and other information on socioeconomic impacts. Um, the next question is on the concentration limit. Uh, it, is, it will help the committees determine whether th this limit is um, um, appropriate as it was explained in the first part of, uh, of this um, uh, webinar, the proposed concentration limit is to address intentional uses only, and it does not represent um, a, a safe uh, use limit. Um, to that end, the committees are asking, uh, are asking questions to assess whether this limit indeed is uh, associated with uh, the necessary quantity of, uh, of microplastics in the mixture to perform their intended function or um, uh, to, to assess uh, or if, if changes are needed. Uh, the second part of the question asks whether what is the proportion, proportion of, um, um, of, um, of these products that contain the microplastics to achieve their intended function in uh, the following ranges of concentrations. This information will help the committees amend the concentration limit if needed and assess the impacts um, of the restriction if the, the limit changes. The information on analytical methods that is requested will help with the conclusion on the enforceability of, of, of the limits. And the last part of the question, uh, aims to exclude non-intentional uses. Uh, for example, if uh, there's any uh, product groups where uh, microplastics uh, are present as an impurity. Uh, to When you're answering this question, uh, we would uh, like to draw your attention again on the definition of microplastics and in particularly of what is a polymer containing particle. It will be very useful if your answers are provided for um, different product groups. We have listed in the question the product groups that are covered in the dossier, but you could uh, provide information on other uses or, or functions if necessary. The next question is on uh, the, uh, the derogation for, for medical devices. Uh, well, actually, it is uh, more than just for medical devices. It is for those uses um, where microplastics are both contained by technical meal means um, or um, the waste that contains microplastics is in incinerated or disposed as a hazardous waste. This derogation is generic in scope. It was um, intended um, at uh, uses where the risk is assumed to be controlled. Um, and so, prim and also primarily at uses in non-industrial labor laboratory settings, including uh, in vitro diagnostic uh, medical devices. 
it is anticipated that uh, such technical means um, for um, uh, controlling the emissions and uh, disposal uh, could be implemented for medical devices within uh, two years. Therefore, a two-year transitional period is proposed in the restriction. With this questions, question, the committee would like to understand the feasibility and practicalities of implementing these technical me means within two years, specifically for medical devices, and also to understand whether other similar uses would be benefiting or could be benefiting uh, from, from this uh, derogation, in particular if um, uh, other companies or sectors are thinking of uh, controlling emissions for, pra for, for microplastics in a similar way. During the public consultation, uh, we, uh, we as the dossier submitter, conducted, uh, made substantial efforts to engage industry and other stakeholders to gather relevant information. We had a call for evidence, a workshop. We contacted over 13,000 potential polymer producers and users, both at the start of the dossier preparation and after its submission. We've had press releases, social media, and, and other outreach. To augment and to complement the information that we received, we also conducted independent re research. Following such an extensive consultation on the uses, a restriction with a general scope is proposed. Therefore, unless um, your use is specifically mentioned in uh, paragraph 6 of the restriction or it is derogated, then uh, the use that use will be restricted from the entry into force of the restriction anticipated in 2021 or 2022. However, if um, uh, the public consultation in this question five aims at gathering information on other uses and for which this um, entry into force will lead to significant socioeconomic uh, impacts. So in this question, we have uh, included um, some examples of information uh, that can contribute to the um, evaluation of the pros, pros and cons of, um, well, first to identify these other uses if those are not in this, uh, already mentioned in the dossier, and to uh, gather the necessary information to evaluate the um, uh, impacts of the proposed restriction. So uh, because uh, if, um, because um, a similar information will also be needed to refine uh, the existing assessment in the dossier. We have also combined this question with, uh, and have made it as a general question on socioeconomic impacts from the proposed restriction. The last question, specific question in the public consultation is on cosmetics. Uh, during the call for evidence, information on 19 polymers that could be impacted by the proposed call in the call for evidence was submitted. And if you recall, that scope is uh, a, a bit larger than, uh, than the one that uh, was uh, proposed in the end. Uh, this uh, table 44 in the annex lists um, on the left hand side the information that was received and how we have matched it with uh, an inky name uh, for cosmetic ingredients. Uh, so we could query uh, information in databases in cosmetic products. During the dossier development, it, uh, uh, there was uh, information uh, uh, was identified that uh, there could be other uh, polymers that would be impacted by the proposed restriction. We recognize that not all those, the uses of all those polymers will be uh, in the scope of the proposed restriction. Um, but the information that we have on the inky name is not uh, sufficient to determine whether they fall in or out of, of the scope of the proposed restriction. Other um, elements are needed uh, to determine um, uh, whether um, the, um, they will fall in scope. For example, uh, uh, polymeric properties such as um, the chain length, the molecular weight, um, uh, the uh, characteristic of the of the uh, of the micro of the mixture, the function of the polymer in this mixture. 
we know that this information is available to formulators and uh, manufacturers of cosmetic products, and this question is specifically addressed to them. In uh, the dossier, we have also published a revised table 88, which now lists um, the polymers in a sequence of what are the most, how they most frequently appear in databases of cosmetic products. Um, this is to assist um, uh, also with uh, how you um, uh, target your answers. Uh, they are listed in a sequence of uh, a frequency in, in leave-on cosmetics. For the rinse-off cosmetics, you would need to scroll down the table. Um, we ask, this question specifically asks uh, formulators and manufacturers for the polymers used in their cosmetic products to consider if their use is inspected by the proposed restriction uh, and how, whether, uh, whether it meets the definition. We particularly want to point you to the physical form of the polymer in the cosmetic mi mixture uh, at the point of release or use by end users. Uh, to, we would like to highlight that the biodegradable or natural, not chemically modified polymers are not considered to be microplastics at the certain uses, for example, film forming with film forming functions are derogated. Um, for those polymers that may be impacted by the scope of the proposed restriction, uh, we ask that you specify uh, their inky name and provide the total number of formulation by this inky and what is uh, the, sh the number of formulations containing this inky that meet the microplastic definition. And for uh, the inky in question two, to indicate the kilograms used last year. If that was not a full production year for you, please specify the period for which you're providing information. To help you answer, we have included a template um, in, um, we have included a template uh, that you can use to submit your answer. We do ask that uh, you submit uh, the responses separately for rinse off cosmetics or leave on cosmetics to allow for um, uh, for uh, customization of the proposed restriction if uh, the results call for it. Uh, there is a link to this uh, template uh, uh, in the web form, but also in uh, it is published together with the information note in the landing page for the microplastics restriction dossier. Very briefly, there are always top general questions that are asked for each restriction dossier for which, uh, for which, which was submitted for public consultation. These are the general topics. They correspond to each of the sections of the uh, restriction uh, report and main elements of the restriction wording. Um, if you have any questions um, on what information can be submitted for each of these topics, you can ask during the Q&A uh, session. For now, I just want to say that we're looking for studies um, regarding the hazard or exposure of um, uh, the hazard and emissions of microplastics in the environment that were published in 2019, as we have done um, fairly extensive um, uh, review of uh, the available literature as of the end of 2018 uh, on information on alternatives, uh, oh sorry, information on cost and benefits, we will refer you to specific question uh, five that um, contains examples of socioeconomic information that uh, it could be useful for the committees. And I'll stop here uh, and we look forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Evgenia. So now we have the uh, second uh, Q&A panel uh, with uh, Evgenia, who uh, just gave the presentation, also my colleagues Sana and uh, Pete again on, on the end. Uh, and uh, we will start with some uh, questions that have been sent in uh, from uh, specifically on the public consultation, uh, and then we will go back to some of the more uh, definition questions or, or, or other questions. So uh, just to uh, inform you that the first one is at 11.54, if that helps you to navigate through the, the questions. OK, so the first question, uh, with respect to the stage public consultation, 
would relevant information submitted after the desired date, which is the four months indicated on the, uh, the public consultation uh, website, still be acceptable to the six-month limit? Uh, and would they be considered uh, by uh, Rack and Siak in uh, forming the, uh, the final opinion? So maybe, uh, uh, Evgeny, you would like to, to start on that, uh, and then uh, others can come in as necessary. Yes, I think I touched in on that during the presentation. All comments that are submitted within, uh, by the end of the public consultation, September the 20th, will be um, reviewed and taken into account in the committee's opinions. If you would like your, um, for, for ease of, um, uh, for, for the, to facilitate uh, the work of the committees, it will be useful uh, if the, they are submitted um, at the key points where these you, these uh, issues, the issues for which you're submitting information, will be um, discussed in the plenary. Your, mm, I think uh, I think that uh, pretty much yeah. answers it. I'm not sure whether my yes. colleagues would like to add. No, I mean I think just to just to stress that uh, comments which are submitted uh, within the the four month deadline. Uh, which is uh, stated on the website, of course, then there is the opportunity for uh, 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 further clarifications, if necessary, to be uh, asked for from the, the RAC and uh, SEAC uh, rapporteurs and, and other colleagues. So it's, we, we definitely um, encourage you to uh, send in uh, important comments, as Evgeny has said, on, on uh, the issues uh, uh, on the uh, hazard uh, emissions and, and, and costs and benefits as soon as you can within the public consultation. Uh, so then we have another set of questions on the public consultation starting uh, about uh, 12.06. So uh, uh, the first one is, uh, do I have to reply to all questions, general and specific ones, if I want to participate in the public consultation? Maybe, Sana, you could, you could take this one. Uh, yes, uh, the answer to that question is no. You don't need to answer all the questions that we have. Uh, so please uh, provide information on the ones that you have specific information on. Thank you. Uh, next question is if I have already submitted uh, information in the call for evidence uh, for 2018, shall I resubmit the same information again or would it be de facto taken into account by the committees? Uh, maybe Sandra again, you can, you can take this one. Yes, uh, so uh, all the information submitted in the call for evidence has been taken into account already as part of the restriction uh, proposal. And the committees uh, can uh, access that information if, uh, if they want to. Um, so, uh, but, but if you see, if you have read the, the restriction proposal and you see that the information that you uh, submitted is not reflected in, in the way that uh, in a, in a correct way, or, or if you have uh, doubts or comments, then uh, please uh, resubmit those comments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question is on the, the baseline. So what information uh, can I submit on the topic of baseline? Maybe, Evgenia, you could take this one. Um, information on baseline that uh, would be very useful for the committees would, would address the tonnages of microplastics used for specific product groups. Uh, or their emissions to the environment. When you are submitting such information, it will be useful to uh, also provide information of how uh, uh, this, this information was gathered. If it was a survey, uh, whether the sur what was the, uh, the representativeness of the survey, um, raw data will in fact also be appreciated. If it uh, if it is uh, if the tonnages or the emissions are estimated, then it will be useful for the committees to know the assumptions, so how you have estimated um, these tonnages and emissions. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question is on uh, alternatives. So, um, what information do you need on alternatives? I think this could be quite a wide level of information both on the, on kind of the risk aspects on and on the impact aspects so maybe pete do you want to say something first and then other colleagues can join in afterwards um yes thanks mark so um yeah as you say it's the, the issue of alternatives is, is really rather broad in terms of the information that is 
is quite often required by the committees when they're, they're evaluating a proposal. But um, I think it comes down to, to three sort of elements. One is the, the sort of the technical feasibility of, of an alternative to, re to replace the use of a microplastic. Um, the second element, which is important, is the economic feasibility of it in terms of is it much more expensive, for example, um, than, than, than a microplastic use. Uh, and the other element that typically is taken into account is, is whether or not the use of alternative is more risky uh, than the use of a microplastic. Um, so just as a, as a general point, perhaps it's worth emphasising that when we've been developing the dossier, we have been in line with the way things will go in the, in the, in the fertilising products regulation, is very much look towards a, long, uh, a, a short to medium term substitution to biodegradable versions of microplastics in the same uses that they are currently used. So um, I think we recognise that quite often those microplastics are there and they're there for a specific reason and they fulfil a specific function. So it's quite often we would want to maintain the function that the microplastic has, but allow that to continue into the future in a more perhaps sustainable way in as much as that those, those materials are no longer persisting in the environment once they've fulfilled their technical function. Hey, thanks for that, Pete. Um, I don't know whether Sanon or Evgenia would like to take the, the kind of more impact part. Sanon, do you want to start? And yes, then? sure. Um, so then in terms of uh, the economic feasibility of, of uh, alternatives, um, we would be interested in the costs of implementing these alternatives. So first of all, to the, um, to the companies, to industry. Um, here it may be uh, that the implementation of alternatives may lead to uh, th the alternatives themselves may have um, may be more costly so there may be uh, kind of raw material costs um, related to them uh, there may be some investments needed to be made in terms of um, uh, the, at the sites themselves um, and uh, and there may also be other running costs uh, in terms of operating costs such as increased energy consumption or um, other other uh, kind of recurring costs. So those would uh, uh, would be relevant. Uh, there may also be um, economic costs uh, for other actors uh, in the supply chain or uh, an impact on consumers, for example, if, if the use of these alternatives would uh, reduce the quality of the product. And those those kind of impacts would also be relevant. Okay, thank you. Anything to add, Evgenia? Maybe it will be uh, also useful to make it clear that if there is, uh, for some uses, uh, there are no um, alternatives at this stage, that this should be identified. Um, and uh, the, uh, the time required to develop, to develop the, to identify and develop these alternatives should, this information should be specified. We'll also appreciate if uh, manufacturers of alternatives um, do come forward and provide information during the public consultation. And um, uh, if, uh, for example, this refers to a biodegradable uh, alternative, um, maybe test results will be useful or at least uh, information on how you think um, the biodegradability criteria that are proposed in the restriction are, are met um, for your specific product. Okay, thank you for that. Very, very important points uh, to be uh, to be made and considered. Uh, next question is on the uh, proportionality. So, how is the uh, proportionality uh, assessed in the the restrictions? So, so maybe again, yeah, you could uh, you could start with this one. Um, yes, um, uh, there are a number of um, environmental concern restrictions that uh, have been uh, submitted to the committees. Um, they um, have a very similar approach to assessing the proportionality of, uh, of the proposed restrictions. Uh, they include um, uh, using uh, the avoided emissions as a, as a proxy for the benefits of the proposed restriction, and uh, they compare um, um, that with the, with the costs of, uh, of uh, uh, stakeholders in society as a whole to, com to comply with the restriction. Therefore, the main quantitative argument for assessing proportionality uh, used for, for these environmental concern restrictions, including the microplastics restriction, is the cost effectiveness. The dossier presents the cost effectiveness 
um, estimated for, sep for separate um, uh, product groups. They're also compared with the cost effectiveness of um, uh, restrictions that have already been submitted, evaluated, and even um, uh, now figure in, uh, are already included in, in Annex 15. Okay, thank you. Any other? Okay, thanks. Uh, and then um, uh, another question on uh, uh, exemptions, or in fact, uh, a little bit touches on the, the point uh, I made at the beginning about the, um, the uses that were not specifically uh, exempted. Uh, if uh, now a use comes up where the um, uh, information hasn't been sent in, in advance, but a uh, stakeholder thinks that uh, uh, an exemption uh, would be justified. Uh, how can uh, how can they um, uh, send in information to to justify such uh, such an exemption? Uh, maybe uh, 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 Pete, you can start, and then maybe uh, others can. Uh... Yeah. So, um, if there is indeed a use that hasn't been uh, considered as a part of the, the dossier preparation, then this indeed is what the public consultation is is there to identify, and then um, the specific question that we have on on uses. Um, that have, have not been analysed and the potential impacts on those uses um, would be the way into providing that information to the committees. But just to bear in mind that um, there are a number of important elements that would need to be included within that justification and information submitted for that, that derogation request to be um, carefully considered by, by the committees. And um, at this point of the process, um, the burden of proof is is even more so on on the industry to to justify that a derogation would be would be necessary. Anything more from other colleagues, Evgenia? Well, may, mm. Maybe um, maybe just to make it clear that um, uh, the, well to highlight um, that um, the merits of a derogation will be judged uh, by the same criteria as the merits of a, of a restriction that are um, identified in uh, in Annex um, 15 of REACH. Um, it does the use lead to uh, and contribute to the concern and what are the um, uh, what are the uh, impacts to uh, society as a result of uh, of this derogation or um, should that be a, a time limited derogation or uh, or an indefinite derogation so that's all that uh, uh, needs to be i think needs to be considered. Okay. thank mm. you uh then uh, we will go back to some more general questions uh on the um the scope and uh, uh, other issues so we start with a question on the labeling and reporting requirements for derogated substances uh like for pharmaceuticals um, maybe, uh, Sana, if you'd like to say something on the labelling, and then uh, Pete, if you could say something on, on the reporting. Um, so the purpose of the labelling requirement is um, to provide the users of substances and uh, mixtures um, information on, uh, on how to use, uh, this, use them and, and dispose of them in a way that minimises releases. And so here in this question, the um, this question refers to pharmaceuticals. So, so perhaps in this case, it could be something like uh, an instruction to to uh, not throw pharmaceutical pharmaceutical products uh, down the drain, to dispose of them in that way. Um, and in terms of the reporting requirement, maybe. yeah. Well, uh, just in terms of reporting, yeah. So, I mean, they're derogated from the restriction on placing on the market. But they are still included yes. within the pr the proposed restriction, as such as it's. It, I think we understand that, that from a from a socioeconomic perspective, it, it's useful for these uses to continue. But quite often, there's an absence of information really in terms of how much of these materials could enter into the environment from their use. So, over long periods of time, the the reporting element of the restriction will allow a more informed um, discussion on, on on risk management moving forward. Perhaps in combination with how the the marketing approval is done for the medicinal products. Thank you. Uh, then we have a next question on uh, printing inks and whether they're in the, the scope of the uh, uh, the restriction. I, maybe Sano, you can take that one. 
Yes, uh, so printing inks are in the scope of the restriction in that the labeling and the reporting requirements uh, apply to them, uh, but uh, the, the ban on the placing on the market uh, does not. Uh, perhaps I can also say, just mention here that printing inks is, is one of the sectors that we don't have a lot of information on, so we would appreciate informational tonnages and uh, in particular if, if there is Okay, thank you very much for that. The next question is in on biocidal products and whether or not they're uh, in the uh, the restriction or, or not. Uh, and uh, the question mentions uh, they they have generally a kind of a risk assessment, but whether uh, uh, whether or not that has uh, played any part in uh, in uh, uh, considerations mm -hmm. of including them or not. Maybe Pete, you can start, yeah, and then can, uh, others can it. follow. Yes. Yeah, so, so very simply, that biocidal products are within the scope of the restriction. Um, they have their specific uh, phased implementation date five years from entry into force. Um, I think we acknowledge that they have their own regulatory regime for approval. But as we said at the start, REACH um, and restrictions specifically under REACH have this safety net um, uh, mechanism by which they can mop up uh, potential risks which, which haven't been addressed by other pieces of uh, legislation. And I think what, what we're addressing really here is the microplastic concern which is typically very different from the sorts of other concerns which would have been taken into account during the approval of a, of a specific biocide. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why we can, look, we can look at it differently. Mm -hmm. But again, just to recognise that we see capsule suspension, obviously it's a very interesting and, and, and novel, innovative technology which is out there and has, has benefits. So this is why the phased implementation is there to allow movement to, to, to biodegradable versions of capsule suspension into the future. Any further thoughts on this one? Okay. So the next question is on the entry into force date. Uh, in the in the dossier, it's uh, suggested that uh, the entry into force date is 2021, but uh, on uh, other communications, it's uh, been mentioned as 2020. Evgenia, maybe you could clarify uh, this issue. Uh, yes. Uh, the the committee is for. Uh, risk assessment and socioeconomic analysis. I think Mark, you already touched on this at the beginning. Um, they have nine months to uh, produce a, respectively, a final opinion and a draft opinion, which is then run for a public consultation. Uh, the final uh, opinion uh, of, 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 RAC will, of SEAC will therefore be adopted um, potentially in March um, 2020. After that, the dossier is handed over to the Commission and where they have three months to produce a draft decision, which is then discussed in the REACH committee and following a decision there. Um, that decision is um, um, consulted with, with Parliament and WTO, uh, and subsequently it will enter in the queue for, for, for the official journal. So all these steps require time, and we estimate that um, uh, potentially at the end of 2021 or, or um, this, this restriction will um, if if, if um, adopted, it will, will come into force. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is on a very interesting question, actually. Uh, I don't know who, who would want to answer this, but uh, um, talking about um, the term we use, microplastics, for this uh, group of, uh, of, of substances, and actually whether it would be better now called micropolymers rather than microplastics. Pete, is that something you could you could well, comment on? Yeah, we could well, we, we could discuss this for a long time. I think, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it's uh, maybe not so so critical because I think the scope of what we're doing is it should be clear, irrespective of of the terminology that we're using. But I think it's worth mentioning that we we took a long, hard look at what the concern around these sorts of materials were that had been labelled with this 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 term microplastic. I think we feel that it's that, that term can potentially not be that useful, um, although we have embedded it within the proposal, we've then defined more specifically what it means. Um, we, of course, extend the range beyond the micro range. We're also looking at nanomaterials. We're basing it on polymers, not necessarily plastics, but that it, it has to be these particles that exist in a, in a certain size range as solid, as solid particles. This is where we consider that this the concern exists because of their ability to persist in the environment and be available to be ingested by organisms and then potentially uh, 
pass through food chains. Um, so, yeah, the terminology, I think, is perhaps a bit of a hindrance around all of this, but we've tried to make the best of, of, of what we have. OK, thank you. There's uh, next questions <coughs> on the uh, uh, interface, I think, between uh, the um, uh, microplastics uh, restriction that we are proposing and the, uh, um, the national uh, legislation that might already be in force or, or member states might think about uh, um, uh, after or, or during the, the discussion period. So uh, can uh, member states uh, make their national legislation stricter than intended in the uh, directive? Evgenia, maybe uh, you <laughs> can... I, I think Mark, you already have the answer, so... <laughs> okay, so thank you. <laughs> yes, this is, uh, this of course, is not possible because uh, REACH is a, uh, uh, a restriction, uh, uh, a single market restriction, and uh, member states cannot uh, make uh, uh, the restriction uh, more or less uh, stringent than uh, than in the uh, the, the legislation. Um, there's a question here on uh, uh, cost and benefits. Um, could uh, could it be defined that an environment, or could it be defined an environmental cost or benefit uh, from the reduction of the use of a dangerous active ingredient? Uh, using microencapsulation be taken into account in, in, in the restriction. I think this is a little bit similar to maybe what Pete said about the kind of benefits uh, of microencapsulation. Uh, are they taken into account in, in, uh, when determining how we've approached this in the, in the uh, uh, restriction? Is there something more that perhaps Evgenia or Sano would, would want to add on this? Yeah, I, I could perhaps. Um, this uh, is probably captured under <coughs> other impacts in the socioeconomic assessment. Um, uh, if there are uh, positive uh, impacts from the existing use that cannot be matched by um, the alternatives, then uh, those will be considered um, uh, potential losses as a result of the restriction. Therefore, information on, on these benefits will be um, very useful. Uh, also, not only explaining qualitatively what these benefits are, but uh, if we could go further and provide, uh, if, if uh, submitters could go further and provide some uh, information um, on to, to help um, monetize these benefits, that will also be useful. I think we have an example in that in the dossier on, on oil and gas uh, where um, uh, you know the threat of industrial uh, major industrial accident uh, uh, cost of, of major industrial accident is uh, is is uh, included on the basis of already existing um, estimates by the European Commission. I think, Pete, I think you wanted also to add yeah, something. Just yeah, just to add, just to build on on what, what I'd mentioned before that I think. If we're talking about microencapsulation, then I, th then as when we develop the analysis, we we certainly recognise that there are lots of benefits associated with this in terms of reducing, for example, operator exposure to to plant protection products or or biocides, for example, when they're being used. So clearly, this is a benefit, um, and and this can be elaborated uh, in the analysis where this is necessary. But perhaps more critically, um, we had established this five-year transitional period to harmonise with the transitional uh, arrangements that are already set uh, and adopted within this fertilising products regulation, which will require the use of biodegradable polymers within these agricultural settings. Uh, and then I think we'd assumed that if a, if a five year timeline was appropriate for this regulation, then um, more likely than not, perhaps this five year uh, time horizon for substitution could also be applicable to these other uses within agriculture for biocidal products and plant protection products. Now, if if this isn't the case and it will take longer to substitute to a biodegradable encapsulation system for a plant protection product and a biocide for whatever reason, then this is really critically important information that, that the committee should be made aware of um, in the public consultation and uh, providing uh, additional justification where this is merited. So it, it would not be sufficient just to say um, five years is not long enough. Um, it would need to say and five years would not be sufficient uh, because of um, X, Y and Z, for example. Um, I think all, 
really within the analysis, just one more thing qu- quickly, is to say that uh, we noticed, we recognised that if the product performance could not be substituted uh, within these proposed phased implementation, then of course at that point it might be that an additional um, period of time could be allowed for certain uses, for example. So we have this sort of idea for for a review at some point. Thank you. Uh, we I think we have time for one more question, and actually you bring that onto uh, the uh, actually the question I think that we can take on the. Um, on the public consultation again. So uh, could information submitted through the public consultation influence the uh, phase out periods, the transitional periods that we've given for uh, for certain uses? Uh, maybe Evgeny, you want to, to, to start with that one? Um, yeah, yes, um, this is one of the standard questions that is asked during the public consultation information on the transitional period of, of the proposed restriction. Um, it, it, it is a key um, element of the um, proposed restriction that uh, the, the, the committees uh, deliberate on. They normally take into consideration uh, the uh, society's readiness to implement the restriction. And by this, they, um, they, uh, they take into account information such as the availability of the alternatives on the market, the market share of these alternatives, or if there are uh, no alternatives, the time required to identify these alternatives and transition to them, um, uh, or the, to deplete uh, existing stock. Other um, impacts to other stakeholders, not only to industries, also considered, for example, member states that will need to um, put measures in place to ensure enforcement. So the time to develop and harmonize analytical methods also has an influence on the transitional period. We hope that this um, these considerations, uh, you can factor in these considerations when you are submitting information on, on the uh, transitional period. Okay, I think we, uh, we need to uh, finish the, uh, the Q&A session there. So uh, I, I'd like to first of all thank the, uh, the panellists from, uh, from both uh, the sessions uh, and also the colleagues who are working behind the scenes on, uh, on uh, helping us to, uh, to uh, have the questions ready for, for answering and also the technical colleagues who have uh, set up the, uh, the WebEx and helped run the WebEx today. Uh, and also lastly, to, of course, to thank you, the participants, for uh, some extremely uh, interesting and relevant questions. And we hope that this uh, information session has uh, clarified certain issues for you and uh, allows a, uh, a good uh, uh, input uh, of uh, information into the public uh, consultation. As I said at the beginning, we will um, publish the recording of this WebEx uh, on our uh, website uh, in, uh, in a, a short period of time, along with a question, of an- a question and answers document that uh, covers uh, both the questions that we've uh, answered today and other questions which are submitted into, uh, uh, through the uh, contact point on our, our website. Uh, and lastly, just to reiterate what uh, my colleague Evgeny has said at the beginning of her presentation, we will also upload a, a small demonstration of how to actually make your uh, submission to the, the public consultation. So this just leaves me to wish you a uh, a good uh, a good afternoon and uh, we look forward very much to uh, interacting with you during the rest of the uh, process uh, in the uh, opinion making so thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon